Historiography is the critical examination of obscured sources to determine if and how certain historical events have been reinterpreted over time, by whom, and most especially, for what ultimate reason. In the year 98 AD, Josephus, the renowned Jewish priest and historian who was born in authentic Jerusalem and who later fought the Romans along the shores of authentic Galilee and who, as their prisoner, was forced to watch the ransacking of the massive temple complex at Jerusalem, was later compelled to issue this telling insight and timely forewarning after a lifetime of observing the manipulative actions and political consequences of his own countrymen. There are those who write histories because they are committed to writing them for the advantage of posterity alone, drawing the facts out of darkness and into the light. Truth is their only concern, while others choose only to pervert the historical truth simply because it is in their own self-interest to do so. Josephus, the Jewish priest and historian who was born in authentic Jerusalem and who later fought the Romans along the shores of authentic Galilee, from his monumental work entitled Antiquities of the Jews, Preface, Verse 1, in the year 98 A.D. In 1893, and again in 1899, at the very outset of his quest to create a religious haven for people of Israeli and Jewish origins, the founder of modern political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, offered these telling sentiments to his few followers. The historic homeland of the Jews no longer has any value for them. It is childish to go in search of the geographical location of the homeland. In any case, I believe that after the next Zionist Congress, we shall proceed in a practical way to the land, any land. These critically important insights were memorialized by the Jewish Publication Society of America in the work entitled Theodore Herzl by Alex Bean, 1941, pages 101 and 413. And Herzl made these comments because the historically correct geographical whereabouts of Israel's true heritage trail, which the ruinous Romans had virtually erased from memory with the slaughter of the last Jew in Jerusalem 1800 years before, and that of the enigmatic Egyptian culture as well, with whom the Israeli culture was so perfectly aligned, were as much a complete unknown then, just as each still remains today. But this is not a coincidence. Rather, it is one of the greatest academic and political failures in history. But even despite Herzl's own admission that the true geographic heritage trail of the Israeli culture was a complete unknown, Others still hastily rushed to build on his muddled foundation. And soon thereafter, the rich farmlands, located within the sovereign territory of Palestine, were ultimately designated by political machinations to be the any land, in which a new Jewish homeland was to be arbitrarily established. Those few of Israeli heritage who were intimately involved in this selection process adopted the term Zionism as their rallying banner, doing so in reference to the name of the mountainous region where the Temple of King Solomon had been built, even though no such gargantuan structure constructed of finely honed stone built by hundreds of thousands of workmen who labored continuously without pause for over seven years' time, as the Bible itself so clearly documents, was either in evidence, nor had any trace of its existence or that of the Second Temple ever been found anywhere within the territory of sovereign Palestine. 
despite the lack of this namesake evidence, still, beginning in 1917, the British dynasty, and only for political expediency, chose to become complicit in the Zionist insurgents into Palestine. In 1919, British Foreign Secretary Atta Balfour confirmed this sentiment when writing on behalf of the British government. In Palestine, we do not even propose to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of that country. Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. 21 years later, on November 29, 1938, on the cusp of what would become World War II, and with the still unabated and unchecked incursion of Jews into sovereign Palestine, as a result of every British promise having been broken under the failed terms of the British mandate, King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia sent a clarifying document to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on behalf of all Arab countries to reiterate their regional concerns. As for the historical claim of the Jews, there is nothing to justify it because Palestine was and has not ceased to be occupied by the Arabs through all the periods and progression of history. And its sovereign was their sovereign. Therefore, the Jewish claim of rights in Palestine, insofar as it rests on history, has no reality. We have observed as one of the effects of the widespread Jewish propaganda that the American people have been grossly misled. This has resulted in the support of the Jews in crushing the Arabs in Palestine. But if we look at the matter from the standpoint of political Zionism, this point of view represents a wrong and unjust way. Its aim is to ruin a peaceable and tranquil people and to drive them from their country by various means. Given to them by the British government, who did not possess the right to impose it upon sovereign Palestine. And the Arabs protested strongly, immediately upon learning of the British-sponsored Balfour Declaration. And they announced their rejection and non-acceptance from the very first day. From this it will be clear to you, Mr. President, that the historical pretext of the Jews is unjust and it is impossible to consider it. Palestine has been Arab since the oldest of times, and they did not leave it, nor did others drive them out of it. And of this, there is no uncertainty or doubt. Mr. President, the Arabs of Palestine, and behind them the rest of the Islamic world, are being forced to defend their lands and their territories. It is impossible to establish peace in Palestine unless the Arabs obtain their rights. So we beseech you, Mr. President, to support those who only want to live in peace and quiet despite the attacks. We have no doubt that the high principles to which American people adhere will cause them to grant support for justice and fair play. This letter was among the many hundreds of other similar correspondences which were subsequently exchanged by numerous parties concerning the Zionist movement and its bid to occupy a land, any land. As a result of King Ibn Saud's intuitive insights, President Roosevelt directed the Joint Chiefs of Staff to begin an intensive on-the-ground interview of the leading statesmen from North Africa, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, 
Palestine, Transjordan, Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. Then, on April 20th, 1943, the American delegation provided the President with their findings, in which they stated, The tension is growing steadily. The Arabs feel that the Zionists, by continuing a worldwide propaganda for a Jewish state in Palestine, have not kept their part of the bargain. There is therefore in the minds of the Arabs growing fear that unless they do something, they will be faced with a decision already taken by the great powers to turn Palestine over to the Jews. Further writing, it is common knowledge that the Zionist undercover military organization, the Haganah, has made plans and has stocks of Tommy guns and machine guns as well as small arms. The Jews particularly feel with their increased numbers and with their increased stock of arms, they can more than hold their own in actual fighting with Palestinian Arabs. However, from previous experience, the Jews realized that whenever serious fighting with the Arabs start in Palestine, assistance from neighboring Arab states will again pour in. It is this increased opposition that the Zionists admit they probably don't have the power to overcome without outside assistance from British or British and American military force. There is an ever-present Arab fear of American support for political Zionism with this proposed Jewish state and Jewish army in Palestine. This is now extending to further fuel the fear of American support for the penetration of Jewish people into Syria and other neighboring Arab areas once Palestine has been fully populated. This memorandum concluded with a single prophetic statement. It should therefore be very clear that a Zionist state in Palestine can only be imposed upon the Arabs by military force. In 1944, as hostilities between all parties continued to intensify, and while World War II still raged, yet another telltale memorandum concerning the question of Palestine was sent to President Roosevelt, which read, The chief of the CID, which is the Criminal Investigative Division of the United States Army, told me the other day that the aim of the Jews, when the proper time comes, will be to seize the whole country by armed force, in the belief that no one will be willing to take it from them once they are in control. He is a bit of a pessimist, but there is no doubt of the strength of the Jews. Then again, on February 1, 1945, Colonel William A. Eddy, the United States Minister to Saudi Arabia sent what has since proved to be yet another prophetic message to the United States Secretary of State. King Abdul Aziz made the following startling statement yesterday to officers of the American legation. As to Palestine, America and Britain have a free choice between an Arab land of peace and quiet or a Jewish land drenched in blood. We do not ask for the removal of the Jews. Those who are there may stay, but there must be no more. We ask no special consideration, only that America settle this Palestinian problem in her native tradition of justice which Americans insist upon for themselves and their neighbors. 
Even despite this overture of a compromise solution, and after nearly 30 years of insurgency, compounded by the catastrophic failure of the British Empire to control the influx of Jewish refugees into sovereign Palestine, as the British overseers had repeatedly promised to do from the very outset, President Roosevelt, weary from war and the carnage it invoked, and now personally faced with the imminent and fearful specter of a world-ending atomic bomb future, saw yet another massive territorial war looming on the horizon, since he rightfully anticipated that many thousands of additional people, those of Jewish heritage, would soon be descending upon the once sovereign territory of Palestine from war-torn Europe. For these exceptional reasons, with the desire to end all future wars, President Roosevelt arranged to secretly meet with King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, and he did so while on board the USS Quincy which lay at anchor on the Great Bitter Lake in Egypt on February 14, 1945. The mutual mission of these two imposing figures was to resolve the question of Palestine with intelligence by authorizing the long overdue critical examination of history. To begin an academic and political process which had never before been conducted at any time prior to or at any time since the British Empire had made their arbitrary decision to forcefully establish a Jewish enclave in sovereign Palestine 28 years earlier. Even in light of Theodor Herzl's own acknowledgement that no tangible evidence existed, which proved that the Jewish culture was ever historically connected to the land or any land. Soon after learning of President Roosevelt's secret meeting with King Ibn Saud, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill immediately scheduled his own meeting with the King to assuage the issue of the unchecked influx of Jewish settlers that was continually flowing into the territory of sovereign Palestine and, with the end of World War II in sight, was on the cusp of intensifying once again. In the following weeks, King Ibn Saud would later relate his impression of both men. The contrast between the President and Mr. Churchill is very great. Mr. Churchill speaks deviously, evades understanding, changes the subject to avoid commitment, forcing me repeatedly to bring him back to the point. The President, however, seeks understanding in conversations. His effort is to make the two minds meet, to dispel darkness, and to shed light upon the issue. The King concluded, I have never met the equal of the President in character, wisdom, and gentility. Then, on April 5, 1945, President Roosevelt sent a written affirmation to King Ibn Saud which stated that, one, he personally would never do anything which might prove hostile to the Arabs, and two, that the U.S. government would make no change in its basic policy in Palestine without full and prior consultation with both Jews and Arabs. And he signed the letter, Your good friend, Franklin D. Roosevelt. But shortly thereafter, on April 12, 1945, just one week after issuing this double promise to King Ibn Saud, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, while placidly sitting for a portrait at his remote retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia, very suddenly died. And their mutually agreed mission to properly resolve the question of Palestine by the critical examination of obscure historical facts and intelligence was never fulfilled. Nine years later, in 1954, 
After witnessing the continuing deterioration of sovereign Palestine, Colonel William A. Eddy, who served as the translator between President Roosevelt and King Ibn Saud at their covert meeting in 1945 while aboard the USS Quincy, was compelled by duty and honor to report the following concerning the question of Palestine. Nothing has been published about the political conversations because nobody who was present has broken his silence. But I am now breaking mine. Further writing. The historic conference had an anticlimax at the White House which has never been reported. In the first week in October 1945, which was barely six months after President Roosevelt's death, the Secretary of State recalled the four chiefs of United States missions to the Arab states simultaneously to have them testify as a group to President Truman regarding the deterioration of American political interests in the Near East. These were the U.S. ministers in Egypt, Lebanon and Syria jointly, Saudi Arabia, and the Council General to mandated Palestine. The four arrived for the White House appointment which had been scheduled for October 10th. However, the four were kept idle in Washington for four weeks with no duties whatsoever because the White House advisors had persuaded President Truman that it would be impolitic to see his ministers to Arab countries, no matter how briefly, prior to the November congressional elections. After the elections, the director of the Near East Office of the Department of State, Lloyd W. Henderson, was finally allowed to bring the four ministers in for a private conference with President Truman, where the spokesman for the group, George Wadsworth, presented an orally agreed upon statement in about 20 minutes. There was little discussion, and the president asked few questions in the meeting whose minutes have been carefully guarded in the Department of State. Finally, Mr. Truman summed up his position with the utmost candor. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but I have to answer to hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the success of Zionism. I do not have hundreds of thousands of Arabs among my constituents. This information was published by the America Mideast Educational and Training Services Incorporated, Washington, D.C., 1951. Three years later, and continuing to ignore President Roosevelt's well-documented pledge not to do so without first conducting a critical examination of the territorial facts, President Harry Truman bowed to the incessant requests of both his former Jewish business partner and the Zionist proponents who had enlisted his aid. And President Truman, faced with an enormous war debt, finally succumbed to the relentless personal and political pressures. And on May 14, 1948, President Harry Truman, whom President Roosevelt never wanted for a running mate, formally recognized Israel's self-declared statehood. And the once sovereign territory of Palestine, the surrounding countries, and the world itself, would never be the same again. Simply because the geographical whereabouts of both Israel's true heritage trail and that of the enigmatic Egyptian culture with whom they were so intimately associated has never been academically resolved by critical examination. Until now. There are those who write histories because they are committed to writing them for the advantage of posterity alone, drawing the facts out of darkness and into the light. Truth is their only concern, while others choose only to pervert the historical truth simply because it is in their own self-interest to do so. Josephus, 
the Jewish historian who was born in Jerusalem and who later fought along the shores of Galilee. From his monumental work entitled Antiquities of the Jews, Preface, Verse 1, in the year 98 A.D. The historic homeland of the Jews no longer has any value for them. It is childish to go in search of the geographic location of the homeland. In any case, I believe that after the next Zionist Congress, we shall proceed in a practical way to the land, any land. These critically important insights are memorialized by the Jewish publication Society of America in the work entitled Theodor Herzl by Alex Bean, 1941, pages 101 and 413. The true location of Mount Zion and Jerusalem, where the Judean King Solomon built a massive temple structure, has never been forensically identified. Even so, the term Zionism was still adopted circa 1890 to identify the quest to establish a purely Jewish state someplace in the world. The geographical origins of both the Egyptian and the Israeli cultures are virtually unknown. This is not a coincidence. Rather, it is one of the greatest academic and political failures in history. It is a matter of record that after leaving Egypt, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But even if this large group of people, who numbered in the thousands, advanced towards Jerusalem at the rate of just a single mile a day, they would have traveled along a path that was more than 14,000 miles long. Yet not a single trace of their wandering existence has ever been found within this region. No encampments, no beaten paths, no skeletal remains, no human waste, no war carnage no validated structures, no graffiti, absolutely nothing. And for this reason, many no longer believe the stories of the Bible to be true. But they are. It is only the theories proposed in the 19th century and the actions they subsequently inspired in the 20th century that are wrong. But 21st century technology has dramatically changed the way in which both the world and all of its historically important features can be viewed. To put this same 14,000 mile distance into yet another real world perspective, the people of Israel, traveling just by land alone, and at the same incredibly slow rate of just a single mile per day, could have easily traveled between the most southerly pyramid fields of Moreau and the most northerly pyramid fields of Giza more than 10 separate times. And even today, despite nearly a century of aggressive attempts to do so, no proven, untainted, or infallible evidence yet exists, which confirms the declarations made by those untrained men in the 19th century as to the location of either the Exodus Route, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, or any other critical point of interest to be either true, accurate, are precise in accordance with the Judaic record. And in the absence of tangible evidence, only theories and untruths remain. And when untruths are spoken often enough, the unsuspecting eventually believe them to be true. However, 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, a 26-year-old by the name of Josephus, became a prominent leader of the resistance movement in Galilee, which had only intensified in the wake of Jesus' untimely death. But despite his intellectual and wily prowess, Josephus was finally captured and taken prisoner by the Roman general Vespasian and his son Titus, who had gone to Galilee with a resolve to put an end to the smoldering civil disobedience once and for all. 
Soon after waging war in Galilee, and with their flanks secured, Titus moved directly on to Jerusalem, where Josephus could only watch as Titus' army decimated the city, executed every single person, and then triumphantly carried away all that remained of the temple treasures. And as a result, with the great loss of both life and cultural icons, the muddled and confused history of Jerusalem, and thus the true whereabouts of Mount Scopus, which is otherwise known as Golgotha, a skull hill, became obscured yet again. As a reluctant eyewitness to the complete obliteration of Jerusalem, and as an intellectual who had studied such matters, Josephus instinctively knew the entire history of the region was once again on the brink of being lost to posterity forever. In recognition of this, and having traveled extensively and intimately throughout both Galilee and Jerusalem, Josephus was compelled to write a voluminous memoir, which he addressed to his like-minded scholarly Greek audience, where among the trove of other critically important facts he preserved were these keen insights concerning the tell-tale characteristics of Jerusalem. Monobisa sent her bones, as well as those of Azadis, his brother, to Jerusalem, and gave the order they should be buried at the pyramids which their mother had erected. They were three in number, and distant no more than three furlongs from the city of Jerusalem. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 20, Chapter 4, Paragraph 3. While to the northwest is Mount Scopus, an elevated plain that lies seven furlongs from Jerusalem, from whose enhanced height a view of the temple can be plainly seen. Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 19, Verse 4 and 7, and Book 5, Chapter 2, Verse 3. Now about this time there was a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men who received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had him condemned to the cross, those who loved him did not forsake him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to this day. Josephus Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 3, Verse 3. Today, in testimony to those tumultuous times, the gate of Vespasian still stands where it was erected nearly 2,000 years ago, right in the midst of the ruined synagogues, where great crowds of people had once gathered together to see and to hear a very special teacher speak in Capernaum, which is otherwise known as Quranus, a Greek term that literally means the Lord's town. The name of Vespasian, along with the name of his son Titus, the invaders of both Galilee and Jerusalem, can still be found right alongside the names of so many other Greek and Roman invaders, benefactors, and scholars, who in each their own quest to gain historical immortality, and as tradition dictated, etched the symbols of their adopted hieroglyphic names into the numerous walls and buildings that span the entire length of the Jurhan River, from the pyramids of Moreau to the pyramids of Giza. Adding to the physical, literary, and topographical evidence that is so abundant and so plainly presented that it stands in stark contrast to the unsupported theories proposed by those few untrained men in the 19th century and the events and actions they subsequently inspired in the 20th century, as they still continue to do. Today, like the Exodus route taken by Moses, the route taken by Jesus also exhibits the physical and historical elements of that particular era with equal clarity. Evidence is indelible as they are precise in accordance with every eyewitness account concerning the travels, the trials, tribulations, and ultimately 
the spiritual power embodied in one single man, whom the hopeful simply knew as Jesus of Nazareth. The geographical origins of both the Egyptian and the Israeli cultures are virtually unknown. This is not a coincidence. Rather, it is one of the greatest academic and political failures in history. Simply because at the outset it was wrongfully declared to be childish to go in search of the geographical location of the homeland. There are those who write histories because they are committed to writing them for the advantage of posterity alone drawing the facts out of darkness and into the light. Truth is their only concern, while others choose to pervert the historical truth simply because it is in their own self-interest to do so. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Preface, Verse 1. The siege of Masada in 73 AD was the site of the final obscuration concerning the true whereabouts of Nazareth, Galilee, and Jerusalem. In recognition of this fact, and with the greatest of foresight and diligence, these many collective decimations became both the inspiration and the passion of Josephus, and his monumental effort to preserve this information for posterity lest all be lost and forgotten. This is the essence of historiography. <laughs>